Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Ambassador. Y'all up? Yeah. All right. Well, it's distinctly my pleasure to be here uh, to share a stage with two ambassadors, uh, Paul Wolfowitz and Andrew Young, uh, really leaders for uh, the American uh, policy space and international relations, but also domestically for many, many years. Ambassador Wolfowitz, you've worked for seven presidential administrations. Uh, you've had experience in Asia and Africa, uh, in, in uh, Central America as well. It's just, just amazing. Uh, Ambassador Young, mayor of Atlanta, Olympics champion, civil rights leader, but also the first African-American ambassador to the UN. So both of you have had a tremendous amount of experience. In fact, we were together a couple of times in Africa, and uh, we were talking about experiences we had in the Philippines separately. But it's a troubled world, but it's everywhere an interesting world. Well, that's where I wanted to get to, just to start. Give us, um, Ambassador Young, let me start with you. Your thoughts on sort of the global U.S., the global outlook from an economic perspective, but also in terms of international relations. Well, I was listening to uh, Michelle Nunn uh, talk about the alleviation of poverty and the changes that have come about worldwide. Those started about the time you were at the uh, World Bank. And the world is better off, probably, than it's ever been before, worldwide. But we had such a coordination and unity. The world really was rationally put together after the Second World War. Uh, and the institutions, the World Bank, and worked, the Monetary Fund, all of these agencies worked almost like they were intended to work. And then um, the technology, well, first the oil boom and then the technology boom uh, destabilized everything, but it actually made almost everything grow economically. But we don't coordinate it, we're not in control of it, it's almost like the world is running us right now. And Ambassador Wolfowitz, what's, what's your take? Uh, I continue to be an optimist. Maybe that's because I think you have to be in order to think about solutions and not just wring your hands about problems. Um, but I think the, world econ the global economy, I think, is on a track that has both promise and problems built in. And it, it's, two sides of, it's two sides of a coin. The positive side is this spectacular growth in technology, which I think is making many, many people more productive. And it doesn't take an advanced degree to be able to manage computers. Just look at these kids who play war games. I mean, they're very good at it. It's, it's a skill that can be learned and taught, I think, much more easily than people my age tend to think. And the other thing is, and this is both an opportunity and a potential problem, is a kind of youth bulge, which is part of the reason China's economy did so well for a long time, and is probably going to run into trouble now because China's population is aging thanks to their stupid one-child one policy. But there is enormous potential in these young people who are so desperate for a better life that they will actually risk their life in a leaky boat to cross the Mediterranean to get to where they think their jobs are. And I think it's very important. I think that's part of what John O'Brien was trying to do in Africa when I first met him, and he first introduced me to Ambassador Young, was to enable those young people to stay in Africa and thrive and have good jobs in Africa. And good jobs don't mean government jobs where you live on bribes. They mean entrepreneurial jobs where you're creating jobs for other people as well. So I want to, I want to get back to the, um, this issue around corruption and government. Um, uh, giving away things for, for political reasons, but I wanted to jump on something I think that both of you said. Uh, one was about sort of the desperation and the ambition that, that individuals have, young people in particular. So you talked about going across the Mediterranean, but I would also say uh, the migration in, from Venezuela is, represents some of this. The migration in Central America up to our southern border is part of the same thing. Look, 
families looking for opportunities in young people. And then Ambassador Young, you talked about institutions and how they used to work before, um, but they're working perhaps a little differently today. All of that seems about tension. There are all these tensions and stresses placed on sort of how we're relating to each other and how uh, we're going to find solutions. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you navigate tension? So both of you were- Well, let me, let me just say, quote Dick Gregory used to say, if you're black and not slightly paranoid, you're really sick. <laughs> 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 and I'm saying it, that if you don't, I mean, we're, we're caught in a, I think this is maybe people are doing better. I, I take Nigeria. Nigeria is so screwed up governmentally, but the private sector is just going off the charts. And you run into smart Nigerians doing business everywhere. In fact, somebody told me that it's supposed to be a billion Nigerians on the African continent by the end of this century. Now that may be more dangerous than the Chinese. <laughs> but I'm saying it, it, but it says to me that um, the news reports and the government to government reports always rep watch the government. When I travel, I, I try to find the, the young people, the people with crazy ideas, and say, like, you probably know him too. I'm, I started with Strive Masiwa in Zimbabwe when he was an idealistic young kid who impressed me basically because he was religious. Well, he became Zimbabwe's first billionaire. And not only does he uh, uh, operate in at least 26 countries in Africa and Econet, but his company gives 2% per quarter to school fees, and they've got over 400,000 students that they are paying the educational bill for. They even sent 40 kids here to Morehouse and Spelman, uh, where they pay all of the expenses. Most of them happen to be AIDS orphans, but one of them ended up as the only black uh, Rhodes Scholar two years ago. And so none of that shows up uh, in statistics. But I'm saying there's something, there's something great and wonderful going on in the world because of the confusion. And we tend to look at the dictators, and we tend to look at the government. But we would resent people judging the United States of America by our government. <laughs> they do, though, anyway. And, no, in, in, I mean, that's, uh, if you read the newspapers, this city is falling apart. And yet we've grown from 600,000 to 6.5 million since I was mayor. We brought the Olympics. We, we, we've, I mean, there, there's... We, we, we were arguing about whether or not we wanted to accept a $5 billion downtown investment to fill in the gulch. And, and, and the city council, it was an eight to seven vote. It was right they, on the edge. We just barely won it. And how can anybody turn away $5 billion of investment, 32,000 jobs? Uh, it might not be perfect, but I'd rather try to fix up $5 billion than to deal with the mud hole that we've had there since the beginning of Atlanta. So you're, so you're super optimistic, both of I you. Am. Uh, it's actually quite <laughs> it's impressive. It's not optimistic. I don't consider myself an optimist. I consider myself basically a person of faith. Ralph Abernathy used to say, I don't know what the future holds, but I ain't worried because I know who holds the future. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that's an important thing to, um, to stay grounded in, and I think it can help push forward when times are tough. I mean, you've done a lot of that in your, your life. Uh, Ambassador Wolfowitz, you as well, uh, you've, you've uh, had to wrestle with a lot of international strife, and Ambassador Young talked about private sector jumping in and filling the void when the public sector's not 
working as well. Are there ways, that we, do we have examples of um, the public sector being reformed to, to get to a less corrupt and more of the people type of structure? I think there are some spectacular examples, but I want to start because Ambassador Young's comments about Nigeria reminded me of what people used to say about Italy, and I hope no, yeah. no Italian Americans are offended by this. But back before this financial crisis hit, Italy had a very successful economy, and people would say, Italy is proof that you can have a successful economy without any government at all. <laughs> and the truth is the government in Italy was so bad that people were driven into the so-called informal sector. Right. And they do very well in that, in that situation, as long as the government doesn't actively suppress them, which unfortunately is what happens in many dictatorships. But I think there are examples of reform. Um, of course, uh, Hong Kong is a spectacular example. Singapore it may not be a model we like, but it's a spectacular example. I think there, there's a very interesting example in Malaysia just a year ago, two years ago, when they had an election that was really revolved around corruption and a corruption that had been exposed partly thanks to the U.S. Department of Justice and it helped get people so angry they actually had enough room to vote the government out of office after I think 30 years in office. And that's why I believe that going after these stolen assets is something that's important. Ambassador Young mentioned Nigeria. When I came to the World Bank, one of the first initiatives we took, and I'm proud that it worked, was to help Nigeria recover $500 million, that's not small change, in money that had been stolen by the dictator Abacha, General Abacha. And the Swiss had it in a bank account in Switzerland. And they said, but we're afraid of returning it to another corrupt government just having it stolen all over again. So we had to put a World Bank seal of approval on it and say, we're pretty confident about how this is going to be spent and it'll be monitored and audited. By the way, audits is a word that comes up every time you think about how to improve government man managing of the economy. And audits is something that Operation Hope is really focused on. That's why, again, I think financial literacy goes to the heart of so many things. And in the case of Malaysia, I think we locate collectively, the US and Singapore and Hong Kong, I think, located over $5 billion of stolen assets, one and a half billion of which were here in the United States. And ironically, they stole $200 million to invest in that movie, The Wolf of Wall Street. I guess they, <laughs> they like corruption. So I think that we could do a lot to recover the money that was stolen from poor people and figure out good ways to get it back. And in the case of DR Congo, which just had a very, I would call fraudulent election recently, it's debatable. But in any case, there are literally billions, I think, that could be located and returned if we had a government to return them to. Well, Paul. I mean, here's what, I'm, forgive me, but I, I, I looked at this country and the period that I read about that, where they call robber barons mm -hmm. uh, were robber barons because they built the railroad. Uh, but their children are, I mean, all of the robber barons are now distinguished families leading the United States, uh, Rockefeller, Mellon, Carnegie. I mean, they were all at one time considered robber barons by the, well, my, my side of the U.S. is the, the Puritan church side, uh, but I broke from them. <laughs> uh, I still believe, but, but there's always, there's always a righteous, quite often a self-righteous judge of what's going on. Now, I was on the banking committee when Italy was, couldn't keep a government 30 days, 60 days. And it bothered me because they were leading European exports. And now I understand it. The, the little home companies that were leading the world in exports, nobody knew their name, but it was Gucci, Versace, uh, and, and I mean, I've there's a that. whole bunch of we know their names name now. brands now that are big stores in every American city that were hand-to-mouth businesses 
when I was in Congress in the 60s and in the 70s. And what I'm hope well, we're here. A lady brought me from South Africa a dress for my wife to this conference and brought me one of those beaded things that uh, usually the ladies wear, but she made one for me to put as a stole over a robe when I'm playing preacher. <laughs> uh, but it's beautiful handwork. And um, we don't have it this time, but most of the conferences that I go to, there's, there are a lot of small business uh, creativity going on that doesn't have a label, that doesn't have access to market. And what I what I work with John on is trying to bridge the gap between these small businesses uh, and say the the market system, and say people like Macy's say, look, if you can supply it regularly. Uh, and the OGOA Act, uh, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which you had something to do with, uh, is pulling these things in. And, uh, you know, because I travel, um, that sort of keeps my wife happy because I pick up stuff <laughs> off. <laughs> I pick up the stuff off the streets. I, I hope that's because you're getting a lot of dresses. No, <laughs> because I, I always bring her something that none of her friends have ever seen. And so they think I've been to Paris. I've been to the streets of Morocco or, or uh, uh, Nigeria or Ivory Coast. Uh, and the small, I mean, Africa has always been, the African economies have always really been run by market women. Uh, and they haven't been institutionalized yet. But that's a process that's gradually taking on. Uh, you know, basically because of they're involved in the technology also. So can I, I I want to, we don't have a lot of time left, so I want to just turn to trade. Mm -hmm. That's a big global issue right now. Um, can you talk about your thoughts on the U.S.-China trade relationship, and then also sort of where you see the NAFTA evolution going? Uh, Tony Ressler said it at a dinner last night, and I agree with him. Um, the U.S.-China trade relationship has been an unbalanced one, and it's not so much about balance. It's not so much about the statistical numbers. It's about the way in which China has been ripping off American technology and American intellectual property. And I think, in a totally bipartisan way, we made a mistake for many years in thinking that all of this would ultimately turn out for the good, because there was no denying the fact that China was much better off in 19. 89 to pick a dangerous year than it was 20 years earlier, much better off. Um, I think the bad turn probably came to some extent 30 years ago to, with that massacre in Tiananmen, and I think Chinese politics started to take a turn toward tyranny, which is where it is solidly now. I mean, it's appalling to me that that's a country that builds concent concentration camps for Muslims, and we worry about Islamophobia, which we should, but what's going on there is really horrible. So I think it was important. I'm not saying the way that this administration is taking on China is necessarily the right way. You can argue about the tactics. But I think to make an issue of China's predatory trade practices is the right thing. But I think in general, to go after trade is a big mistake. And I agree with An Ambassador Young when he said that the opportunity in Africa is for people to sell into our market and for small companies to become big companies. And just to be clear, I'm not, I hope I'm not being self-righteous. I don't think there's anything wrong with billionaires. Billionaires who build something are wonderful. Billionaires who stole a billion dollars from their people are not wonderful at all, and that money should come back. Amen, I agree. But, yeah, the, the thing we, we've always agreed on is that the world is in motion, uh, and things are constantly changing. 
and our knowledge and our reporting is always a little behind. Now, China looks good from here now. I went to China, though, in the year 2000, representing the United, I mean, the National Council of Churches to check on religious freedom. And I met with the Ministry of National Minorities, who happened to be a Chinese Muslim. And he will say, I wish I could spend more time for you because you all did a wonderful job. Now, here's China looking at us. You all did a wonderful job of integrating uh, blacks and whites and brown people. And uh, He hadn't quoted to Gregory, right? <laughs> no, but I'm saying that from China, what we're doing here looks good. He was saying that he's got, uh, he said, I have 102 national minorities who are not a part of what we call China. John Bryant looked up something while we were talking uh, the other day, and I can't, don't know how to stop this thing, forgive me. Uh, but uh, I, somebody gave it to me. They didn't teach me how to use it. But, um, <laughs> the thing is, it said something that there had been 180,000 riots in China that had been put down by the military uh, since something like 2010. They kind of, yeah. Yeah, and um, so that is, it's not the stable society that it looks like. If it was the stable society that we're reading about, it would be a threat. But we're going to have to bail China out. And, and I think part of what the U.S. government has always, the role that we've had that we're now rejecting, we have run the world. Um, we've been the world leader. And I think Carter did it best of all, because Carter got along with everybody. Everybody did pretty much what we wanted them to do. But we didn't get anybody killed, and we didn't kill anybody, because uh, he was a listener. Uh, and he could get Egypt and Israel to agree. Uh, he could get Panama to quit fussing and arguing and protesting and sign a treaty. And we've had styles in America that come out of our insecurity and, and want us to be macho. And we want to be able to be in charge of the world and let everybody know we're in charge. Uh, but we get appropriate kickback in conflict. Uh, I know, I don't know whether we agree on Iran or not, but I, we got a huge Iranian population around here. And anytime I meet somebody, I say, when's the last time you've been back to Iran? What's going on? The Iranian citizens say, well, one young woman particularly said, you know, in the last election, we had more women elected to the Iranian parliament than they had clergy. And so that says to me that if we let it alone, there is, uh, there is a political evolution and reform going on even in Iran. Uh, and. Um, the more pressure we put on it, the more it's putting down the reformers. And so I, I was even against, I mean, I even withdrew my opposition uh, to boycotting South Africa because I, I, I realized that we had other ways, other things we had to do uh, to get South Africa free. And uh, the Sullivan principles which said, don't pull out of South Africa, uh, but uh, set an example. Set an example and bring young black uh, executives into the process and prepare them to take over South Africa. And Coca Cola and others did that. Uh, but. So, so we're just about out of time, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak on, Amer on America's role in the world. and. Uh, how, how you think about it. Do you, are you where Ambassador Young is? I think so. We might argue about tactics, but in fact, I would say that one of 
President Carter's big contributions was to put human rights and freedom front and center in American foreign policy, and I think that's where it belongs. And I think being a... <laughs> our biggest competitors, which I would say are China, Russia, and Iran, are most dangerous competitors, um, putting China in, the, in a special category, are unfree countries. And I think freedom is the greatest way we have of promoting change in those countries, change that would be positive for their people and certainly for our interests. So I, I think having the United States be a leader in the cause of freedom, we're not, God knows we're certainly not perfect. We talked a lot about freedom in the first 50 years and there was none for a large part of our population. But the fact that we talked about it, I think forced the change and the more you talk and focus on it and the more you expose hypocrisy on that subject and the more you expose the fact that there are concentration camps in China today that are not quite as bad as what Hitler did in Germany, but they're pretty awful. And they're based on religious discrimination. That's something we should be talking about a lot, I believe. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Wolfowitz, Ambassador Young, we're out of time. It's been a great, great to have you on stage. Thank you. Let, let me say that uh, many of you might not know Dr. Bostick, but he is now uh, in charge of our Federal Reserve, that beautiful building on 10th Street and Beach Street. Uh, that's his uh, hangout. Uh, and um, they have always quietly behind the scenes, uh, even since I was mayor and when I was congressman in the 70s, uh, the Federal Reserve was always willing to supply us with information and guidance, and they kind of keep up with the economy of the nation and the world, so... Um, we do what we can to keep things together, for sure. Yeah. I just, heard, just met you today. I heard last night you're the first African-American head of a Federal Reserve Bank. Hopefully not the last. Hopefully not. Thank you. Well, we are way out of time. And a great so, moderator. So thank you. thank you very much, and uh, we'll move on. Thank you.